we could talk for a minute or two about the Tulloch case. Um, was I, I take it that was an area where the Federation uh, had recognized there was uh, a need for some litigation? Um, was the case that you chose uh, chosen because of particularly good facts, or were you waiting for a case? In 1986, this de minimis exception was put into the rules um, such that uh, obviously the Clean Water Act 404 program covers discharges of fill material and discharges of dredged material into waters of the U.S. So with respect to discharges of dredged material, uh, this provision was put in that excluded de minimis discharges of dredged material for normal dredging operations. So normal dredging operations are logically um, the things the Corps of Engineers does when it dredges navigation channels. Um, but we were very concerned and, and following the 86 regulation began to hear indications of this exemption, this loophole being used for private wetland drainage. And um, that was a huge concern because there was a huge amount of wetlands potentially being lost through this loophole. So um, we began looking for cases. I came on to the Federation in 87, um, beginning in probably 1988. Um, you also had the National Wetlands Forum. You had this real interest in wetlands. And we began looking for fact situations to, to address this de minimis exception. Um, my concern being that we needed to have a really good set of facts. So we actually um, began to start exploring factual you know, situations out there. Uh, what really triggered this lawsuit, and we were not trigger happy, but this was a horrendous fact situation in which this loophole was being used in a very, um, very blatant, with core, f core facilitated way in which um, down in North Carolina, uh, you are seeing ditches dredged through wetlands in, very, in a very mapped out way at one, like 100 meter on a grid system to um, dig these ditches through wetlands in order to lower the water table and the wetlands rule. Um, a wetland is to be a wetland essentially it has to have water within the top 12 inches and so they would were literally um, dredging through these wetlands in a way that avoided um, literally side casting the ditches and avoiding obvious discharges of dredge material on the side of the ditches but digging through and then they would wait a few days for the water table to go down then they would bring the Corps of Engineers staff field staff out to the site to map the areas in which the water table had gone low enough so this was a very deliberate effort that ended up um, draining you know, hundreds of acres of wetlands and it was being done as a pattern and practice in that part in the coastal plain. So um, this was, to me, it was just offensive and not to mention illegal. <laughs> and so <laughs> it, it provided very good fact situation and that's what we did. And, and um, I worked with Dirk Carter who's a very um, expert wetlands attorney in the, with the Southern Environmental Law Center because he could be the local the local counsel but also the local expertise and eyes on the ground as we pursued that litigation which we brought in late 1990. And as a result of that litigation the rule was changed and so there was initially at least a period of success there. Um, what was the reaction of the development community at the time and um, when the uh, Federation entered into the agreement and the new rule was put in place, uh, did you feel that the rule was pretty safe or were you concerned at all about potential challenges to the regulation? We knew that the rule would, it took some time, by the way, between the settlement and the rule. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, some extensive amount of time, but um, we 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 knew. I mean, the the, the um, Virginia Albright with the firm uh, at that time, Beverage and Diamond, 
filed that lawsuit the day before the rule actually showed up as a final rule in the Federal Register. So uh, we absolutely knew the litigation was coming. Um, we actually sought out that rule. I mean, that it was a very intentional process on our part that, okay, we could win this case, uh, but it won't have really lasting effects unless we can um, have it have a broader impact. So we actually, uh, our objective early on was to, to try to parlay uh, those very good facts into a rule. Right. And, and as you said, for a little while at least it, <laughs> it worked. For a while it worked. So. For a while it worked. And um, then, you know, maybe getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I, uh, even when the the rule was overturned, mm -hmm. and I am getting ahead of myself a little bit, but um, it had the effect of really highlighting a huge problem that then ultimately helped to spur the change in the, at least the Virginia, uh, help, helped, it was a motivation behind what ultimately became the Virginia State Wetlands Law. So, you know, somewhat philosophical about how these things play out. 